Shalom everyone. I hope you're all doing well and enjoying the last uh, little bit of your summer. Anyways, this week's Parsha, Parsha Re'e, we read one of the Haftarot of the Yeshiva de Nechamta, the uh, Haftarot of Consolation from Yeshayahu. And one of the most beautiful psukim in this week's Haftarah is where Yeshayahu says to us, Hoi kol tzameh Everyone who is thirsty, go drink. Go to the water. Now, what's the idea? What's the comparison? Is it telling us, you know, which is, by the way, a good idea when it's hot outside, especially in Eretz Yisrael. I understand there's a, uh, has been quite a heat wave, so it's important to drink and keep hydrated. But beyond the, uh, maybe the medical advice and the uh, benefits of drinking water and staying hydrated, what's the message? So, of course, we understand that water is compared to Torah. It says, Ki hem chayenu v'orech yamenu, that Torah is our life, is our sustenance. Without Torah, we will spiritually die, and just as we need to eat and drink and take care of our bodies, we of course have to take care of our souls. And someone who doesn't take care of their bodies, their bodies wither and die. So too, someone who ignores the needs of their soul, their soul, their neshama, could chas v'shalom wither and die as well. And therefore we can't ignore our bodies, we can't ignore our neshamot either. Torah is our life. Hihem chayenu. And the Gemara and Brachot tells a very beautiful story about Rabbi Kiva. That uh, many years ago, when Rome ruled Yehuda, and Am Yisrael were forbidden from learning Torah, so Papis ben Yehuda saw Rabbi Kiva. And he saw him against Roman decree, trying to gather a shear to get uh, some Torah learning going. And he said, Rabbi Kiva, are you crazy? Aren't you nervous? That's uh, what's going to happen to you. The Roman government will see you and you'll be, you'll, you'll be killed. You know, it's very dangerous. And Rabbi Kiva said to him, I'll give you a mushal. I'll give you a parable. He says, a fox was once walking along the river and saw a fish uh, who was swimming around in the, in, the, in the lake in the river. And he said to them, hey, what are you, what are you doing? What are, what are you running from? And he says, uh, I'm running away from all the nets that the humans are trying to catch us with. And he says, hey, listen, fish, I have a great idea. Listen, why don't you come onto shore with me, onto dry land, and we'll live together just as our ancestors did years and years before us. When we live together, which, by the way, as an aside, is an interesting connection if you want to talk about evolution and the source for evolution in, in Judaism. Anyways, so the fox says, come, join me on dry lands. And he says, you don't have to worry about the humans then and nets and fishermen trying to catch you. So responds the fish to the fox, and he says, you know, you're supposed to be, you know, the one who's so smart. Fox, you know, outsmarts people. That's stupid. That's ridiculous. How can you say such a thing? He goes, if I come out there, right, I'll be far more endangered, right? Here, so yeah, maybe I have fear, but I'm, I can breathe. I can live. But how much more so if I go out into your environments, if I have to worry about the fishermen in my environment, if I go out in environments where I can't even breathe, so how much more dangerous would that be? So says Rabbi Kiva, the same applies to someone who tries to live a life without Torah. And he quotes the Pasuk, Torah is our life, Torah is our sustenance. So therefore, life is difficult. But if we live a life without Torah, we are seriously endangering ourselves much more than the most endangered environments. So, therefore, Yeshahu says, Hoi, kol Go to the water. Now, go learn Torah. Now, when Am Yisrael was in the Midbar, it says in Sefer, uh, in Sefer Shemot, it says, Ve'chu shloshet yamin ba'midbar v'lo matzumayim. They're wandering the desert for three days. They didn't find any water. So Chazal tell us that the early Nevi'im enacted that we don't go three days without having Torah laning. So, because why? We can't survive, we see from that Pasuk, three days without water. So too, we can't go three days without Torah. Now, the idea is that if we can't survive without water, we can't go three days without Torah either. And that's why we read the Torah every Shabbat, every Monday and Thursday, so chas we should never have more than three days consecutively without Torah, because how could we survive just as we couldn't survive without the water? Now, I was wondering about this pasuk, everyone who's thirsty, go and drink, go to the water. Is that obvious? I mean, if you come and you tell me that you're thirsty, I don't have to tell you, so drink, because that's obvious. You know that if you're thirsty, you need to drink. So what's, the, what's Yishayahu really telling us? 
So I was thinking that maybe there are many people who are thirsty. I have a relative of mine who I know that when he's thirsty, so he goes and drinks Diet Coke. The problem is that anyone who's been thirsty and gone and drink soda, or pop, depending on where you're from, that it doesn't really quench your thirst. In fact, it actually makes you more thirsty. Maybe there's a little bit of hydration there with the water elements, but pretty much the sugar content actually makes you more thirsty. So therefore, it doesn't really achieve the purpose of hydrating you correctly and properly, and it actually uh, makes you more thirsty. Or someone who goes and drink an alcoholic beverage that actually dehydrates you much more than it hydrates you, right? But they drink it to quench the thirst, but in fact, it does at sometimes the opposite, sometimes nothing at all. And sometimes people drink things for their sugar rush, right? They, instead of drinking water, they'll drink some soda or some energy drink or vitamin water, so try to get a little rush of energy and excitement. But what happens is that anyone who's, uh, who stuffs their face with anything with a high sugar content knows that there's a big high followed by a very deep, steep decline. Uh, a, the, they call the sugar crash. And I think that's true also in the spiritual world. We're often thirsty for spirituality, but we choose a drink other than water, other than Torah. And we're tempted by the fancy ads of the, of the, the soda worlds, of the Cokes and the Pepsis and the, uh, um, the Red Bulls and the vitamin waters, right? And they often come up, these advertisements of these big companies, they come under the guise of some lofty, even spiritual message. I was thinking back to um, maybe... Maybe in the late 80s, there was a huge Coke campaign. Um, and it was very, very beautiful, even inspiring, of people from all over the world coming together, singing, I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. I would sing it for you if I thought I had a good voice. But the idea is, I'd like to sing together with the whole world, singing in unison in perfect harmony. A beautiful lesson of Achdut. Go drink Coke, because it brings world unity. And that was kind of the implied message. And there was even ad campaigns for Coke that echo teachings of Torah. One was, live on the side of life, right? This is like the Torah teaching of Bechai Behem. I want to live life. I want to live life to its fullest. I'll drink Coke, right? Pepsi used to have a slogan, you've got to live, and Pepsi's got a lot to give, right? Teaching, wow, well, drinking this sugary drink is much more important than just uh, drinking a nice drink and enjoying the flavor, but it can give meaning to your life. And that's the goal of this advertising campaign. I read recently vitamin water, which is something I actually enjoyed drinking before I read this article, uh, is 95% of it is water and sugar, and the 0.5% of, of the ingredients are the vitamins, the other things. And of course, the nimshal is that the secular and material world which surrounds us does the same does the same as the Cokes and the Red Bulls and the Pepsis and the vitamin waters. It appears under the guise of goodness and righteousness, morality and correctness. And it's very confusing because most often the values of modern Western society, of which we are a part of, contain valuable elements and meaningful objectives and messages. But unfortunately, there are many times that they are poisoned by the flavoring of the time, of, that, uh, of the society. And it's very challenging to distinguish between the good and the bad, especially when it's advertised that it's so good and not bad. And that's the challenge that we struggle with. In fact, I think that is the message maybe of the first pasuk in our parsha of Re'eh. Re'eh anochi noten lifnechem hayom bracha uklala. Now most people, when they read that pasuk, they say, okay, Hashem has put before us bracha and klala. But that's not the case. I believe that when it's telling us bracha and klala, it's all one and the same. Well, one, one person's kala is another person's bracha. Another person's kala is someone else's bracha. It's very confusing. And in fact, it reminds me, and by the way, often it comes under the guise of that. The kala may appear to us as a bracha, and the bracha can sometimes appear as a kala. And I think that we learn this even earlier from Gan Eden. Gan Eden, Adam and Chava, and I think that was maybe a microcosm for our lives, our Gan Edens where we are Adam and Chava, and we are confronted with the Eitz Hadat Tovra. The Eitz Hadat, of course, was the source of the temptation that led to the first Chet, and Adam and Chava. And it says the Eitz Hadat Tovra, the Tov and the Ra were intertwined. They were combined. They were so hard to distinguish. 
In fact, the Sporno has a very interesting commentary. He says that the Eitzadat Tobara actually refers to our negative capacity to choose what is superficially good, even though it's bad for us, and that we can reject what is superficially bad, even though it's, it's in fact, good for us. And I once heard someone say that maybe the Eitzadat has a modern-day parallel. That maybe the internet is the eight hadat, so full of knowledge. All the knowledge in the universe is almost can be sought and found in the internet. Right? Just pick up your phone, and you have access to so much information that's uh, maybe unparalleled in history that any person has access to. Just pick up your phone, press the button, and ask Siri, and you can get almost any information. But like the eight hadat, the internet, and like almost everything else in the world is tov and ra intertwined. And it's very hard, very difficult, very challenging to distinguish what is the tov and what is the ra, and it's very confusing. And the confusion that is inherent in a world of tov and ra intertwines is a challenge and a struggle that's not simple and very often leads to spiritual decline. And that is the challenge. In Elul, we begin this Shabbat, Rosh Chodesh Elul, we start with saying, Le David. And Le David, the first few words are Le David, Hashem Ori Ishi Mimi Ira. Hashem Ori, Hashem is my light. Maybe Elul, after a difficult summer, right? Summer is often, you know, time of spiritual dehydration, right? We have Hashem is our light. Hashem gives us the pathway so things become clear. So Tov and Ra becomes a little more easy to distinguish. Re'ei Anochi Notem Lifnechem Hayom. Hayom, according to Chazal, teach us that Hayom is maybe referring to Rosh Hashanah, says the Zohar. Hayom, right? Today, light. Rosh Hashanah is that day, is where the light is shining, where things are clear. Things are clear in the day. During the day, when we say Shema, we say Shema in the morning and the night, Kumecha. In the daytime, we say Emet V'yatziv. That truth is, it's Yatziv, it's upright, it's clear. In the daytime, things are clear. At nighttime, Emet Be'emunah. We need Emuna because there's so much lack of clarity in the world. Elul begins to give us some clarity. In the summer months, we often get distracted. It's vacation time. Right? The summer months are hot. You know, people you know, become a little bit lax in their spiritual uh, routines. Kol If you're spiritually dehydrated, go. Go to the water. Get some clarity. Know what the right drink to choose is. And don't get tempted by those other drinks that come under the guise of goodness and correctness. The Gemara Masechet Tani teaches about Rabbi Chinina Bar Idi, and he says, "Lama nimshlu divrei Torah lemayim." Why is Torah compared to water? Dichtiv kol tameluch lemayim, and it quotes our pasuk from our Haftarah. And the Gemara answers as follows: Because Torah, as we know, like water, goes to the lowest places. That water always goes to its lowest spot in gravity. And if you think that you can study Torah when you're arrogant, you're wrong. That's why, of course, the greatest Torah scholar of our time, of our history, is Moshe Rabbeinu, who is the most modest. Because Torah, like water, goes to its lowest place. And therefore, if you're arrogant, you can't learn Torah. You can't learn Torah if you have conceit and, and you're haughty. Why is that? And I believe it's because if you want to be great, in the spiritual world, you have to be modest enough to reevaluate your direction, your mindset in the world, because sometimes things are unclear. And we need to constantly recalibrate and reevaluate where we are, where we're going, because sometimes we can veer a little bit off the path if we're not too careful. And unfortunately, that happens to most of us. Elul is the time that demands of us, Hashem Uri, let the light shine to show us the proper path to recalibrate. It's kind of like going to the doctor. Hashem should bless you all. You should be healthy. You should never have to go to the doctor. But we all know that we have to eat healthy and exercise. And often we don't. We become lax. We just, you know, forget about it. We're just too lazy. And then we go to the doctor, and the doctor says, and by the way, I'm not talking about personal experience. And we go to the doctor, and the doctor says, you have to eat healthy and exercise. And you're like, oh, gosh. And you know it's true. And you knew it was true before you went to the doctor. But all of a sudden, what changes in you? The doctor wakes you up. And that's why we blow the shofar starting from Elul. Why? Right? Wake up from your slumber. 
You knew that you had to do tshuva. You know what the right choices are to make. Sometimes it's confusing, but you know. So sometimes we get a little less careful. We fall asleep at the wheel, God forbid. Right? We kind of don't pay attention. We become a little complacent. Uru mishen atzchem. The shofar is like going to the doctor, telling us what we already know, but waking us up to do it. Torah meshivat nafesh. The Torah restores our soul. Right? Just like if you're, if you're so parched, so thirsty, it's so hot outside, you feel dehydrated, and you take a nice, cool glass of water, and you feel reinvigorated. That's the idea. That's Torah meshivat nafesh. Restores you. That's what Yeshua is telling us. Lechu lemayin, go to the water. Now it's interesting, the word is lechu, go to the water. Some people, unfortunately, wait for the water to come to them. You know, they say, okay, listen, if a rabbi comes to my house and he gives a shear and I happen to be in the same room, okay, so I'll listen to the shear. That's nice. But lechu lemayin means that you have to be proactive. We have to not be tempted by the fancy advertising of the Cokes and vitamin waters and Red Bulls and energy drinks of the world, of the spiritual world. Lechu lemayim. We have to go to the water, to the right drink, to what will meshivat nefesh, will restore our soul, bring us back to the proper path. You know, the prophecy is, Hinei yamim ba'im, that days are coming, will there be lo rav lechem, lo lamayim, that people won't be hungry for bed and they won't be thirsty for water, Kim Lishmoat of Hashem. They just want to hear the words of Hashem. People are thirsty for the word of Hashem. People are thirsty for spirituality. Their soul is parched. They're dehydrated spiritually. There are many Jews out there in the world who are so thirsty for Torah. But they don't know what to drink. They see all these ads for all these other types of drinks that sound so interesting and so, you know, flavorful, right? And so so such interesting, uh, you know, designs and, and mix of flavors and, and uh, cool marketing schemes. It's very confusing. They don't know what to do. Water, maybe, comparison, looks a little boring. But in the end, it doesn't quench their thirst. It doesn't give them what their body needs. So, too, Yeshua was saying, drink the water. Drink the water. We have to show the world the purity of our water, the purity of Torah. Everyone agrees, every doctor, every person in the health field agrees that the best and healthiest choice of all liquids is water. It's not a dye drink, it's just naturally no calories. There's no negative aspects to water, it's so pure. No one bathes in Coke, no one showers in orange juice. But water, so pure, so pristine. Elul is connected to water. Water is a source of life on earth. It's the first form described in the Torah. In the beginning, Hashem created the world, and there was water. Water is fluid, it's changeable, and of course we know it's softened what it contacts. We mentioned Rabbi Akiva before, who saw the water hitting the rock, and he realized that, wow, water can make a hole and a dent in a rock. So surely Torah can make a difference on me, even though I'm stubborn, even though I'm challenging, I'm difficult. And it's hard to change. Torah can impact me. You just have to let it. Elul is the time when we have to do a little cheshbon and nefesh. To do a spiritual accounting. To make sure that we're drinking enough. That we're taking the right drinks. That we're not getting spiritually hydrated. Right? Maybe we need to drink a little more. Maybe we're not drinking enough. That's something that we have to do. That's what Elul demands of us. And we have to let it impact us. Even though the water is hitting us, we have to know that it has to hit us and let it penetrate our minds and our souls and our hearts. And I think that's what we have to focus on as we come up with the new year. There are some people who have the who have the minhag of going to the mikvah during the month of Elul. Some people go every every morning. Some men, especially in the Hasidic world, but even the non the month of Elul in preparation for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And there is actually a, an interesting prayer that some people say is composed. I don't know who the composer was, but for before they enter the mikvah, and I'll just read it in English. Tvila in water softens us; it makes us malleable, dissolving some of the rigidity of who we are, and this allows us to decide who we wish to be when we come out of the water. The water changes us neither by washing away something nor by letting something soak into us, 
but simply by softening us so that we can choose to remold ourselves into a different image. And that really is the message of Elul. L'chul Go into the water. Realize what you have to change into. Realize that maybe you need a spiritual bath. Maybe we need to get rid of the schmutz that has accumulated on top of us throughout the last few months. Maybe we are, we've been choosing the wrong drinks. Maybe we haven't been drinking enough. Hoi kol tzameh l'chul May Hashem bless us all that we should all connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the most meaningful way to appreciate the value of Torah and to immerse ourselves in Torah in a way that we can feel fulfilled spiritually and Bezrat Hashem affect the world in a greater way and bring the beauty of Torah to the entire world and Bezrat Hashem that should bring a Yeshua not just to us personally but to Am Yisrael and the whole world collectively. Shabbat Shalom everyone. Look, look forward to seeing you back in Eretz Yisrael today. Shabbat Shalom.